Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Paul of June by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So, I have five books remaining in the series now, including this one. This book is set between June and June Messiah, and kind of explores the downfall of Paul. Well, let's have a look. There is a blurb here, so I'm going to check out the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. Um, this is very much going to be more of a vlog-style one, where I update it each day as I go. So just keep your eyes peeled. So the blurb. Dane reads... Between the end of Frank Herbert's Dune and his next novel, Dune Messiah, lies a mystery. How a hero adored by a planet became a tyrant hated by a universe. Paul of Dune begins the story of those twelve fateful years and the wars of the Jihad of Paul Muad'Dib. It is an epic of battle and betrayal, of love and idealism, of ambition and intrigue. Above all, it is the story of how Paul Atreides, who achieved absolute power when scarcely more than a boy, changes from an idealist into a dictator who is the prisoner of the bureaucrats and fanatics who surround him. This is the story of what became of the heroes of Dune, the Fremen warrior Stilgar and the weapons master Gurney Halleck, Paul's mother Jessica and his sister, the child witch Alia, faithful Chani who loves Paul, and Princess Arulan, the wife who will write his legend. It is also the story of the War of Assassins, fought when Paul was a boy but marking him for life. The way the punctuation is in this, it, it reads as though Charney loves Paul and Princess Arulan, but she definitely doesn't, because the two of them are kind of, well, one's his official wife for politics, and one is like his actual love. So I just thought this was interesting. We start off and Paul's building a, a shrine to his father, Duke Leto, on Arrakis. Um, and they're talking about how basically it's just going to become a tourist trap and people are going to sell bits of rock cake, like chipped off of his tomb and fake bones of his and stuff um, because that's what people do. So a great quote here, A Child's History of Mwadib by the Princess of Rulan. Among Mwadib's staunchest friends was Gurney Halleck, troubadour warrior, smuggler and planetary governor. More than all his triumphs, Halleck's greatest joy was to play the baliset and sing songs. His heroic exploits provided his fellow troubadours with material for many songs. And Stilgar goes off planet. Um, and we get, he took a sip of water, not because he was thirsty, but because it was there. How long have I taken water for granted? When did I start drinking water because it is a thing to do rather than a thing for survival? And that just is interesting me because I've always really loved the way that water is treated on Arrakis. We actually have a scene where the Fremen are being trained to swim on Arrakis in like water, which obviously they see as like holy and the life's blood and all of this stuff. Um, but they need to learn to be able to swim and to fight in water because they're going to have to go and fight Muad'Dib's wars off planet. And then we have a great quote here from Mother Superior Raquel Alberto Aniral, founder of the Bene Gesserit School. Humans have a tendency to complain whenever the old must give way to the new. But change is the natural way of the universe and we must learn to embrace it rather than fear it. The very process of transformation and adaptation strengthens the species. A great quote here, a man never gets over losing his son or his honour. So here we have a quote from Emperor Paul Muad'Dib, third address to the Landsrad. The universe is a sea of expectations and of disappointment. And from the wisdom of Muad'Dib by the Princess Arulan, uh, his consort who's, write, consort who's writing these like biographies of him. Former friends make the most bloodthirsty enemies. Who is in a better position to know how to inflict the greatest pain? And the young, Ju uh, the young Paul, because we go backwards and forwards between like in between June and June Messiah and then when Paul was young it actually I don't think it worked particularly well I think they might as well have done those as separate books but hey ho um, so his mother Jessica says are you having dynastic dreams Paul do you want to be Duke Thufa says that anyone who wants to be Duke would not be a good one Thufa is correct quote here from Duke Paulus Atreides letter to his wife Helena politicians and predators operate on disturbingly similar principles and Paul's father on it because uh, Paul's father's going to get married, and we have the the June equivalent of the the red wedding. But anyway, uh, Leto looks at Paul and he says, "This is supposed to be my special day, Paul, but you might well steal the show. You look as if you could become emperor yourself." And obviously later on he does. So a nice little bit of foreshadowing there. Great quote here: "If no one knows your name or your accomplishments, then your life is no more memorable than sand blown on the wind." And uh, a quote here from Thufa Hawat from Strategy Lessons, and this kind of covers as well the, the interactions between laser beams and the shields, um, which has been an important plot point throughout the books. In fact, in some of the prequels, we actually learn how they were created. But um, he says, when a laser beam strikes a shield, the destructive interaction is wholly disproportionate to the initiating energy. Both parties are completely annihilated. This is a perfect metaphor for politics. And he's right. So great quote here from Duke Leto. Um, the blood is always on your own hands, even if you have someone else do the killing for you. Any leader who forgets that will inevitably become a tyrant. I thought this was really cool as well. So Paul is getting married. This is Paul, I guess, older Paul. Um, he's getting married. Um, and he's getting married on June. And he sent out a summons for all of the noblemen 
to come and visit him on Arrakis, but he orders them all to bring a ship's hold full of water, um, which um, Iruland says, a neat trick, such a thing will not unduly strain the coffers of any planetary lord, and the Fremen will delight in it. A perfect symbolic gesture. And I agree, it's very cool. But again, I enjoy the way that water is looked at throughout these books. We get this from the Assassin's Handbook. Weapons come in an infinite variety of shapes and designs. Some look exactly like people. And this is from a Bene Gesserit analysis of human behaviour from the Wallach 9 archives. Individuals can be honourable and selfless, but in a mob, people will always demand more. More food, more wealth, more justice, and more blood. Quote here from Reinvar the Magnificent, jungler artiste, rumoured to be a face dancer. Those who seek fame and glory are least qualified to possess it. And that made me think of reality TV stars. We have hit this here from Bronzo of Ix, the true history of Muad'Dib. So he said, Just as Leto Atreides was shaped by his father, so it was with young Paul. A strong sense of honour and justice passed from generation to generation. This made what eventually happened to Paul an even greater tragedy. He should have known better. Alright, here we get a reference to Occam's Razor, which I thought was good. The idea behind Occam's Razor is that the simplest solution is often the correct one. So we get, Occam's Razor suggests that may be the real answer, Roland said. The simplest answer does make perfect sense. Occam's Razor is dull where the Bene Gesserit are concerned, Alias said. And we get this little line comparing Paul to an archaeologist. Hmm, uh, perhaps you missed your calling, sire. You might have been an archaeologist instead of an emperor. Fenring chuckled at his own suggestion. People know me for my jihad, but I like to think I'm excavating the truth of humanity, digging up what must be found and purging what must be eliminated. Always seeking the truth, always pointing toward it. And then we get, basically, someone betrays Paul and he serves them some water and it turns out to be the water that's reclaimed from the dead child so that was nice and bleak. But yeah overall Paul of Dune by Brian Herbert and Kevin J Anderson probably the weakest of all the Herbert and Anderson collaborations so far. Um, my main issue with this is that it does a lot of jumping between the past and the present and I just feel as though they could have just separated them out into different books. Um, I found it quite jarring really, but also I've never been that much of a fan of Paul Atreides as a character. He kind of bores me, so you know, there was that. Overall it was a week 3.5 out of 5, but obviously I'm glad I still read it and I'm going to continue with the remaining four books of the Dune series. So there we have it, that's what I made of Paul of Dune by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, Bye bye